John's Gospel, chapter 6. Our text will be verses uh, 60 through the end of the chapter. I uh, have read over this a couple times this week. It's fantastic. Fantastic. I, I love the Bible. <laughs> but there are some parts of it that just really grip you. Amen. Well, like Dr. Jeremiah was talking about this morning, there, there are certain swords that stick us. All right? And uh, this may be one of them this morning. All right, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, uh, this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Now, of course, that was uh, in reference to Christ talking about e eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and we're going to explain that in a minute. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see me, or see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father." From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you, twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Let's pray. Lord, we do love you, and we know, Lord, as soon as those words proceed from our mouth, that, Lord, it is a, a failing love compared to your love for us. And, Lord, it is in your love for us that, Lord, secures the relationship. Lord, you are good in every sense of the way, good in all of your dealings with us. Lord, even the hard things that you allow into our life. And we thank you for them. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you through the Lord Jesus Christ. And as always, Lord, we pray this morning that if there's someone here that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, thereby having a relationship with you, I pray that you'd help them today. And for those of us that know you, God, revive our hearts. Lord, we pray that you would stir us up, Lord, to make the proclamation of the gospel the main thing of our lives. Lord, we know the good news. We rejoice in the good news this morning. But Lord, help us not to be selfish. Help, it, help us to share it with others. For Jesus' sake, amen. And after the Lord Jesus had left Judea, where he was confronted with, uh, let's just say, not very favorable Jewish people, he went into Galilee. And there it seemed, at least for a time, that the people were attracted to him. He had performed some impressive miracles there. He had turned the water into wine at Cana. He would healed the nobleman's son. He would multiplied the loaves and the fishes by the Sea of Tiberias. And this last miracle, that is the multiplying of the loaves and fishes, had in one way or another so impressed the people that for a, at least for a time, 5,000, upwards of 5,000 people were there to hear his teaching. He was drawing impressive crowds. In a short time, though, the crowds began, began to thin. Many of his followers went back and no longer walked with him. And we see this begin to happen towards the end of chapter 6. Most of those who had followed him were of the what's in it for me crowd. And Jesus identified them in John chapter 6 verse 26. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles. And there's a point to that in a moment I'll share it but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. He said, you're following me because I fed you and you want fed again. So that's the what's in it for me 
crowd. Now, the miracle that Jesus speaks of, he says, you seek me not because you saw the miracles. Some translations say signs. Those that Christ spoke of were designed to teach. In fact, in, in the end of the John's Gospel, we read this in chapter 20, verse 31 and 32. But these are written, and what he's speaking of is the things that Christ did. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. In fact, there are seven major uh, miracles recorded in John's Gospel, and all of those were designed to point to who Jesus was and why he was here, why he was, uh, his ministry was to them. So the miracles that he performed were proofs of his messiahship and his sonship. Now, think about this for a minute, because this is very pertinent to our society. America is literally entertaining itself to spiritual death. And, it, and so this is pertinent to us. As, as long as Jesus was entertaining, as long as he was feeding them some physical food, he was popular. Uh, again, that's in the what's in it for me. Give me a show. Feed me something. Eat. Give me something. But when he began to re reveal the truths of who he really was and what his, he was doing, many could not take it. And we see that in verse 60 and 61. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Now, what, what was it that he was teaching that was so offensive? Well, first of all, he was teaching them of his divine origin. John 6, 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Verse 38, For I came down from heaven. Verse 50, This is the bread which cometh down from heaven. John chapter 6, verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And then verse 58, this is that bread which came down from heaven. Five times in that short passage, Jesus stressed the fact that he came down from heaven. This was a unique claim. In this claim, we find Christ. Uh, affirming his deity, the fact that he is God incarnate or God encased in human flesh. He's affirming his pre-existence, that is before his birth he was and, and existed in union with the Father, which is the next thing that it affirms. And then lastly, the incarnation, again him coming and taking upon himself uh, the form of man. All right, secondly, they found offensive his teaching on the cross. John chapter 6, verse 52 through 56. Then the Jews strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Note their flesh and blood. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Now, obviously, Christ is not teaching cannibalism. He's not talking in a literal way of them literally eating the body of Christ or drinking his blood. This is imagery that speaks of his giving his body and his blood on the cross and the need to spiritually appropriate what they had done, what he had done rather, for them. So they are offended because of who Jesus said he was, that he came down from heaven, that he was God incarnate, that it was the Son of God. They were also offended by what he claimed to be doing for them or going to be doing for them at the cross. And the cross has always been repulsive.
to certain people groups. Um, the thought of someone dying for their sin, that's what Christ is talking about. Giving their body and their blood was hard and is hard for some people to accept. One person's reply to the gospel message somewhat typical. I don't need anyone to die for me. Well, I beg a differ. You do need someone to die for you, and Jesus Christ is that someone. You see, to accept the teachings of the cross, that is that Jesus died for your sins, you must willing, be willing rather to do at least three things. Number one, you have to admit that you are a sinner. And that's hard for some people because it strikes a blow at our pride. We have to come to the point where we say, yes, Lord, you are right. I agree with you. I admit that I am a sinner. Now, you know, if for fun, I should have a say that this morning, but I'm not going to do that because that's, that's hard for us to even sometimes verbalize that I am a sinner. I have offended a holy God. I am a stench to his nostrils. I am nothing and I can do nothing. I am guilty before God. A lot of people have a problem with that. that. The pride issue is what keeps a lot of people from coming to Christ. Secondly, not only do you have to admit that you are a sinner, but that you owe a sin debt. The Bible says for the wages, that's what we earn, the wages of sin is death. We owe a debt because of our sin, a debt that is impossible for you to pay. You say, well, Brother Mike, I, you know, I'm not all that bad, but you are bad. When you say you're not all that bad, you're bad, right? At least got some bad there. But even if you say, well, uh, you know, I, I'm going from, I, I know that I've, I've got some things in my life, but I'm going to get it straightened out. And even if that were true, and you could from this moment on live a life of perfection, which you're not going to do, but even if you could, it does nothing about past guilt. It would be like you, like Brother Jim. I've ridden with him before, so this could be reality. No, I'm just I'm messing with you. I get in Brother Jim's car, and we're, we go to the store, and Jim, Brother Jim, he, he's talking, not paying attention. He's going 60 mile an hour and a 30 mile an hour speed limit. And you know what happens? The light comes on, they pull him over, and they give him a ticket. And Brother Jim says, I don't want to pay this. So he goes to the judge, and he says, look, judge, I, I know I messed up. I, I broke the speed limit. I'm guilty. But if you'll just let it go this time, I promise you, I'm going to be good from now on. I'm never going to, I'm never going to speed again. What, what do you think that judge would say? Well, first of all, he'd be highly suspect about the future, but, but it doesn't make any difference. He's still guilty, and somebody's got to pay that ticket. And it's the same way for our sin. We are guilty before God, and somebody's got to pay. And if you think that you're going to change that, and you're going to somehow erase that guilt, you are wrong, and you will end up paying eternally in hell. Unless, thirdly, you can admit that you in yourself are helpless to do anything about it. And you look to Jesus Christ to pay your ticket. That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it, Brother Jim? But he's done, he's done infinitely more than pay our speeding ticket. He's paid for the guilt of all our sin, past, present, and future. Hit stamp paid in full to those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. But you have to do all those things. Admit that you're a sinner, that you have a sin debt, and that you can't do anything about it, and then look to Christ in faith to pay that debt for you. The biggest obstacle to those admissions, though, is pride. I, I'm not a bad person. I, I can make my own way. You know, we'll sing the song, I did it my way. I don't think he's singing that anymore if he didn't get saved. I don't need anyone to die for me. This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And by the way, the word hard there doesn't mean difficult. 
but it means rough or offensive or intolerable. In other words, it means it meant to them, we just can't accept that stuff. Okay? In other words, the saying was revolting to them. It offended them. Boy, we hear a lot of that today, don't we? Verse 61, Jesus says, does this offend you? Here, uh, understand it's translated here in the King James Version. From the context, we understand it to mean to attend to or consider what has been said. Their reaction to his teaching was just to write it off and then eventually write him off. Verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. One of the problems they had in addition to their pride was their preconceived ideas. They had their ideas about salvation. They had their ideas about the Messiah. They had their ideas about what it took to please God. And again, there are a lot of people around a lot of churches like that today. They're content to stay around the church, to enjoy what it has to offer them, until someone teaches something a little different than what they believed or what they've always believed. Instead of investigating what is being taught, which all of you should do, you should never just sit and listen to me. You should be Berean Christians and go home, search the scriptures and see if it's so. I'm, I'm not afraid of that. Truth will stand on its own. And if not, I need to change. But a lot of people, instead of believing, or I'm, I'm sorry, investigating their own beliefs and attitudes, they confront the teacher and say things, well, I don't like that. I'm going somewhere else. And then they make a, a career of church hopping Till the, trying to find a church that believes everything exactly the way they believe. Even though some of their beliefs are more traditions than scripture, or more culture-oriented than Bible-oriented, but we won't go there. Their, their problem is like these followers in verse 60. It's that they're not willing really to be taught. I mean, think about this. This is Jesus Christ. This is the word incarnate, the epitome of truth. And they're not willing to learn from him. It really shouldn't scare us. <coughs> they're not willing to be taught or open to the fact that Perhaps somebody else is right and I'm wrong. Again, there are people like that, not open to different views of Scripture. And by the way, we don't have to have uniformity to have unity. In, in non-essential, I'm not talking about essential, but in non-essentials, guess what? There's room for us to disagree a little bit. Right? Right? In fact, I disagree with myself on certain days. Discipleship means following. We all know that, but it also means learning. When these people quit being willing to learn, the fact is they wouldn't even think about what Christ said. They said, this is, I, this is rough. I'm offended. That's what they said in Mike's translation. Paraphrase, I should say. It never occurred to them that they, they might be wrong or that they might not know something. And so they were fit and they just quit following you. I, I encourage you 
to be open to the teaching of Bible-believing preachers and teachers that may be different from yours. Now, I want to qualify that. Bible, preaching, teaching. Okay? Now, to me, that means they have a high regard for the Bible. And they're, they're starting to get, there's an independent Baptist at the local ministerial meeting. That's pretty rare. It's getting less and less. But there are people who have a high regard. This is, this is the inerrant, inspired, infallible word of God. And, and it is not only inspired, but it's sufficient. It, it is, gives us everything that we need to equip us to live a life that is pleasing to God. It doesn't need to be embellished. It needs to be embraced. But we need to be open be, to teachings of others at least until we investigate in the Word of God to see if that's true. Because it may never have occurred to you, but, th but you might be wrong. I might be wrong. And if, but if we hold in a stubborn way and we block out when people say something different than what we have always embraced, we will never grow. We will not grow. It stops because pride is the infectious disease that kills the learning. We don't want to be like these guys. Oh, that's hard. I'm, I'm offended. I'm out of here. They set it to the peril of their own soul. Again, we need to respect those who have a high view of Scripture and work diligently to accurately interpret it and consider what they say and check it out. But these people were closed-minded. Whoa, I can't buy that. That's a hard saying. Who can hear it? Let's get out of here. Go somewhere else. He's not even done packing lunch anyway. What's in it for me, right? That brings us to the second point. The crowd thins. Sounds like a drama, doesn't it? 62 through 66, what and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was. I love that. I'm explaining in a minute. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who, who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come to me except it were given unto him of my father. From that time, many. Oh, Jesus, you blew it. You're not being seeker friendly. You're running people off. Many, it says, went back and walked no more with him. Notice, again, what caused them to be offended. Christ claimed to deity, verse 58. His teaching on the cross, verse 53. Life in Christ, 50, 54. In verse 62, the Lord suggests the alternative. Now remember, they're offended. Oh, this, are, oh, this offends me. Well, Jesus suggests an alternative. What? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. Now, some believe that's a reference to his future ascension. In a, a casual reading, you would probably draw that conclusion. And it could be. Again, I'm not going to be dogmatic. But I think that what the Lord is saying, well, if this offends you, pause. What if I just go back to heaven? They could not receive his incarnation, so what if he took it back? 
Well, that would cause a big problem, folks. Not only for them, but for all of us. If he did, they and you and me would be hopelessly lost. The work of redemption would not have been completed. In fact, there would be no redemption if he did that. So the Lord further proceeds to thin the crowd as recorded in verse 63 through 64. He points out their spiritual inability. It is the Spirit who gives life. And by the way, we need to remember that. Uh, even as believers, it's the spirit that gives life. Apart from his work, there is no spiritual perception. Jesus illustrates that in verse 64. Judas, one of the twelve, now think about this. He's been with Jesus, he's seen his character, he's seen his love, he's seen his works, he's seen his miracles, he had heard his words, yet he did not believe. Now why? The answer is simple. He resisted the work of the Holy Spirit until he could not respond. And by the way, that's what's so danger about, dangerous about putting off a decision for Christ. You, you cannot get saved anytime you want. You can only get saved when the Spirit of God is working in your heart and begins that work of conviction and drawing you. That's the only time you can get saved. Every time you put it off, every time you say no, your heart gets a little harder and a little harder and a little harder until you are like Judas and you cannot then come to Christ. You know what I think? I think there's maybe some in this room, I don't know because this is primarily a hard issue, but there may be some in this room who will eventually go away. I know it's happened to a lot of young people raised in church. They've been around the truth. They know the truth, okay? But they come to a point where they may not verbalize it, but they act it out, I'm leaving. And then they turn their back on life. Selling out what this life has to offer. And you then walk with him no more. Then there's further thinning. Verse 67. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Now think about this. He, he's already ran off most of his crowd. Now he's going to turn to the deacons. Are you going to leave too? Well, not deacons, disciples. Inner circle. Again, Jesus is not very good at building a church. He's running people off right and left. Now he's going after the deacon board. I think we need to make an obvious point here because we live in a culture that is all about winning, all about success, all about numbers in the, in the church. You know, if you've got a lot of numbers, you're successful. But Christ, who to me is the model of ministry, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm silly, but I just think Jesus is the model for ministry. It's obvious that he's concerned about quality as well as quantity. Here he is probing his disciples, refining them, purging them, removing the dross. 5,000 followers and then bang, we're down to 12, and now he's going to test them, see if they're genuine. And he asks them, do you also want to go away? And, and I would ask you the same probing question this morning. 
Do you want to go away? Well, note Simon Peter's answer, 68 and 69. Then Simon Peter answered and said, answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. First of all, Peter said, well, Lord, who, to whom shall we go? And if you've entertained the thought of just dropping out or maybe going back, we don't talk a lot about backsliding these days, but we should. Backsliding means going back on your spiritual progress, turning back to the old life. You want to give up on the Lord, where are you going to go? Are you going to go back? I, I don't know your past, but some of you may have been drugs or sex or alcohol or emptiness or sin or ruin. I know for my own life, I, I, I was a, uh, assured of ending up being a drunk uh, and probably divorced. Do I want to go back to that? It doesn't even make sense. And again, I don't know what your past is, but it doesn't make sense. And that's what Peter said. Well, Lord, who who we go? Why would we go? Why? You you have the words of life. You're the one, Jesus. And that ought to be our rally cry. You're the one, Jesus. Would to God that every follower of Christ would have that kind of resolve. I can't go back. I can't go back. There's nothing there. For better or worse, I'm with Jesus. Verse 69, we know and believe. We have come to believe that and know that you are the Christ, that is the Holy One of God, the Son of the living God. You see, what Peter was doing was affirming what the crowd was rejecting. They said, this is a hard saying. Peter said, no, it's not hard. It's true. And then you get to verse 70 and 71. The Lord has to correct Simon a little bit because he said, we believe that. But the Lord corrects him, not we, Simon. Verse 70, 71, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. One is not only a rejecter of the truth, but even worse, he's a betrayer of the truth. He's going to be the one that sells Jesus out. All right, how can we apply this quickly this morning? Again, a casual reading might leave us with little to go home on, but I think we can see some important things from this passage. Number one, not all is as it seems. There were, as it seemed, 5,000 or so disciples, but in actuality they were not believers. So salvation is a heart issue. Secondly, just because a person goes to church or is baptized or reads their Bible, we cannot say that they're saved. Salvation is the supernatural work of God in the heart of the sinner. From man's view, it is a response of submission and belief to the claims and teaching of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, warning. Closeness to the truth does not mean reception of the truth. Fourthly, you must believe who Christ is and what he has done for you. And then lastly, never turn back. Never. Never turn back. Where Peter said it well. Where shall we go? If you turn from following Christ, there's nothing left. Yet, I know some of you in this room might. That grieves my heart. Again, especially young people. I... I am burdened. I, I, we've had dozens and dozens of kids that have come through our church and Christian school who are no longer serving the Lord. There, and again, some in this room. 
might go back. But the question is where? And, and why would you do that? Resolve it in your heart this morning. Never, ever, ever to turn back. Remember, it's a small step from turning a little to turning all the way. Father, we need your help this morning. Lord, we present the gospel as and sincerely and forcefully as we know how, but Lord, it's not up to us. All we are is little, little bitty, insignificant messenger boys at best. God, it is up to you and your spirit to convict and convince of sin and woo the sinner and then bring about regeneration and, and then seal with the spirit. Lord, we can do none of those things. And so we ask this morning that you would work in hearts and lives, not only those who need to be saved, but those who are saved, and maybe in one way or another, turning back. Lord, may this morning we renew our resolve to go on with you forever and ever. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand. We're going to sing hymn number 390. 390. Again, the main part of the invitation, if